Hi, and welcome back to Chemistry 1032 Lab instructional videos. I am your host, Dr. Russell Betts, and I'll be guiding you through today's experiment. Today's experiment is entitled Chemical Reactions. It is a three part lab. Part one is reactions of metals. Now, in that experiment, we're going to be taking three different metals and reacting them with hydro uh, hydrochloric acid. And we're going to see the effects that the hydrochloric acid has on the metals. Part two will be reacting reactions with aqueous solutions. Aqueous solution simply means uh, the materials are dissolved in water. We're going to mix these different aqueous solutions together and see what the result is. I'm not going to tell you because it is rather dramatic and a lot of fun. Part three, reactions of acids and bases. You'll be putting two different, uh, one, excuse me, you'll be putting one acid with one base and seeing what happens. You'll be putting a different acid with a different base and seeing what happens. Uh, again, I'm not going to tell you what happens because it is a lot of fun to witness these for yourself and to be a little bit surprised uh, by it. So with that, it is especially important that you bring your safety glasses today because we will be working with acids. You want to probably wear gloves the entire time just to be a little bit more safe. Proper clothing, proper footwear is absolutely critical today as we are using acid and uh, you have to have proper footwear on today. A lot of today's lab involves balancing chemical equations. So I'm going to go through two examples of how to go about balancing equations. Perhaps you've seen this before in high school or in other chemistry classes and you have a way that works for you. Feel free to go ahead and use whatever method you like as long as it gets you to the right answer. I'm going to show you the method that I show my students to use when they first start learning how to balance equations. Now to balance an equation what that literally means is that the atoms on the left must be the same as the atoms on the right and in the same proportions. That is to say, if I have 16 barium on the left, I must have 16 on the right, for example. You can't have less atoms on the left than you do on the right. Now, what I tell students to do is go ahead and just make a list of the atoms that are involved in the equation. So here we have a barium. Let's just write BA. Here we have a hydrogen. So let's just write hydrogen underneath that and chlorine underneath that. So I just made a small list of the types of uh, atoms I'm dealing with and then count. Well over here right now we have one barium on the left so times one times BA. We have one hydrogen. One times hydrogen. We have one chlorine so we write one times chlorine. On the right hand side we have right now we have one barium Oops, I put barium again. Let's put number one there. We have two chlorines. Put number two there. And we have two hydrogens. See, there's number two there. It tells me I have two hydrogens. The number two here tells me I have two chlorines. And there's an imaginary one to tell me I have one barium. So we have two hydrogens on the right and only one hydrogen on the left. Two chlorines on the right and only one on the left. So this equation is what they call out of balance. So to balance this equation, we have to make the left and the right side have the equal number of atoms and the same atoms. So for example, here I have two chlorine, here I have one. So we have to change something. Now you cannot ever change the chemical formula. Even though it might be tempting to put a two right here, don't do it. Don't change the chemical formula. Instead, simply put a two right there. That's known as the coefficient, and that's telling me that in this reaction, there are two HCl molecules. So now we have to go through the entire equation again and readjust our numbers. One barium, so there's still only one barium on the left. Now we have two hydrogens, so let's put a X through that, and the number two. We have two hydrogens on the left, but we also have two chlorine on the left. Two chlorine on the left. One barium, two chlorine, two hydrogen. That actually balances the equation, just putting the two here. Now, in these spots, if nothing's written, it's assumed to be one, but if you want, you can just go ahead and write the number one in there if you choose to. If you don't write it, I'll assume you mean it to be a one. If you do write in a one, that's fine. So that's balancing equations. That's, that's how you should approach it, and that's the systematic method to use.
here's another example of balancing equations. This equation is obviously a little bit more complicated, but we're going to have the same approach as we did for the easier example. Let's just write the atoms that we have down the center. Now, here's a case where we have NO3 on the left and NO3 on the right. These are called polyatomic ions. And when you see these in a chemical reaction and you're trying to balance the equation, verify that the same polyatomic is on the left as is on the right. NO3 here, NO3 there. That makes balancing this equation a little bit easier because now we don't have to break the nitrogen away from the oxygens. We can leave them all together. So let's just say NO3. We're going to leave this as a unit. We're not going to break it apart into its representative elements. And that's, we can do this because NO3 is here and NO3 also occurs on the other side of the arrow, meaning it doesn't get used or destroyed in the reaction. Now, on the left-hand side, we have one copper, so one times copper. We have one silver, so one times silver. We have one NO3, so one times NO3. On the right-hand side, we have one copper, but now we have two NO3s, so let's just write that down. We have two NO3s and then one silver. Now, as a general rule that I like to follow, when I have polyatomics on both sides of my equation, I like to balance them first. It's not always the case, but it's certainly uh, usually the case that by balancing the polyatomic first, the rest of the equation will kind of fall into place. So let's balance the polyatomic. On the right-hand side, I have two. On the left-hand side, I have one, two and one. That means I have to place a two here to balance the NO3s. Now I have two NO3s and two NO3s. So that's, but that also makes me have two silver. I have one copper, two silver, oh, and I change that to two NO3s. I have one copper on the right, one silver on the right, and two NO3. So we're almost balanced. Now we have to balance the silver. And we simply write a two in front of that silver, and that balances our entire equation. Let's verify that. One copper, one copper, two silver, two silver, two NO3, and two NO3. Just like before, if you like to write in the ones, you can. If you leave them blank, I will assume you meant one in that position. And that's how you balance an equation with a polyatomic ion. This is the setup for part one of today's experiment. Here we have some aluminum, some copper, some zinc, and this is the waste bottle. I've taken my test tubes off of my bench. These are just empty test tubes. I put a little bit of acid in this one because I want to react each metal with acid. So you want to have three test tubes with acid in them. Take one metal for each test tube, place it inside. For this video, I'll give the example of aluminum. I'm going to take out a little piece of aluminum using the forceps that are provided. So just kind of get in there as best you can, grab a piece, and just drop it into the acid solution. Place it back in your test tube holder, and take it back to your bench. And then watch and observe to see if any reaction takes place. Don't forget, when you're done with the reagent bottle, close the cap tightly. Part two of today's experiment requires us to put about 0.5 milliliters of six different reagents into six different test tubes. I have labeled my test tubes with labeling tape and a blue marker. So this one here is sodium nitrate, sodium hydroxide, sodium phosphate, calcium chloride, sodium carbonate, and magnesium chloride. I want to be very careful to make sure that the right reagent gets into the properly labeled test tube. For example, here is a bottle of sodium carbonate. I want to take this bottle and make sure it gets into this test tube because this is labeled sodium carbonate. Now let's take about 10 drops of this. This is 
a little drop. This one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's about right. It doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be exact. Just get it about ten drops. Do that for each of these reagents and uh, take it back to your bench and then we'll work with a spot plate to do the reactions. Continuing with part two, now we have each test tube loaded with the proper reagent. We have a spot plate and we have some what are known as pasture pipettes and pasture pipette bulbs. Uh, they're essentially droppers. You can just use them just like they were droppers. Now this part of the experiment requires you to carefully read the book to make sure you're mixing the right reagents in the right wells. Carefully follow the book. For example, if I wanted to mix this reagent silver nitrate, just take this spotter or the dropper, put some into the dropper, take the dropper and drop the required amount of liquid into one of the wells, and then read the book, figure out which one of these other five reagents have to go into the same well, and watch for a chemical reaction. Now, a chemical reaction could be it gets hot, could be it bubbles, could be it changes color, could be it forms a solid. Look for one of those things when looking for a chemical reaction in this part of the lab. This is part three of today's experiment. Again, I have labeled four different test tubes for four different reagents, HCl, NaOH, HC2H3O2 and NAHCO3. Make sure that the correct reagent goes into the properly labeled test tube. Same as before, just take one of the dropper bottles and drop about 10 drops into the test tube that's labeled, for example, NAOH, which is right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. One for good measure, doesn't matter if you have 10, 11, even 9. That's not really critical. As long as you have, you know, somewhere around 10, you'll be fine. Do that for all the reagents, and then take them back to your bench for experimentation. Continuing with part 3, once you have the reagents back at your desk, read the manual carefully to ensure you're mixing the correct reagents in the correct proportions. Once you are assured that you're mixing the right things together, take one of the test tubes and pour it directly into the other and look for a chemical reaction. Remember that a chemical reaction may not involve a color change or precipitates or bubble formation. It may simply be the reaction gets hot. To check to see if it's getting hot, take the test tube and rub it on the back of your arm or onto your fingers to see if you can feel any kind of heat coming off of the test tube. That heat could be indicative of a chemical reaction. If you don't see any bubble formation and there's no heat evolving, it could be that there's no reaction. So simply report no reaction. 